Kondile. Uh, she is here with us. And then we've got uh, the area that covers issues of public entities. In some areas, Jefferson we tried to deal with the issue of uh, the select committee and just indicating the where these programs are being implemented in provinces. What does it mean for provinces? So what we did, Chairperson, was then to look at the realignment of planning, uh, budget, and, and the service delivery as in an integrated way. We then um, have, of course, the context of the pandemic that is well known and its impact on our plans, as well as then the national state of disaster that was declared, uh, also to impact in terms of situational analysis. And then we look at what happened with the budget that got revised in June. Uh, 2020 and the, the by Minister of Finance. So then the, when that budget had to be reprioritized, we then also had to relook at our strategy as well as our APP. But we just bring to attention that with COVID, we had to reprioritize funds to focus also on relief measures and sustainable livelihoods as per the pronouncement by the NCCC. We also then need to reprioritize the interventions and then um, look at also repurposing the state to, to improve delivery of performance uh, in the midst of the pandemic. <coughs> then that we develop then the what we regard as crisis uh, response plan, cluster and sector recovery plans that had to be looked at as a per the directive of the NCCC uh, that we needed to respond to save the sector um, in line with the economic recovery plans that needed to take place. But also then the MTSF 2019-2024. Uh, we then, Chairperson, saying that uh, we then had to also uh, deprioritize or look at other priorities and uh, remove other projects that might have been in the APP. And then projects that don't directly support relief measures had to also be to take a back seat. We refocus on integrated and medium term planning uh, to ensure resilience as well as inclusive development and not be constrained by the pandemic itself. And then we sit and we do not develop the plans and the sector. We then focus a uh, chapter in uh, our efforts to improve capacity and capability of the state to respond efficiently and, and effectively. In that uh, regard, uh, we then looked at the whole process that we are indicating to you uh, at this stage, uh, that um, if you look at what happened uh, between 2021 and financial year, particularly in March, we were hit hard in 2020 with the pandemic. As a result, then the situation analysis had to be undertaken. And as I've mentioned, we looked at then the national territory tables uh, with the special adjusted budget that included also then how this impact on the APP, which we had to revise, uh, including the reprocessing of the budget towards relief. We then also looked at the APP going forward on how we're going to then uh, respond in the year 2021. <laughs> we also then looked at the issue of the MTSF uh, in February uh, 2021, and then tabled the estimates of national expenditure. That's what ENE stands for. Uh, we then have also looked at the strategic plan, if it is still valid or not, and how, where are the adjustments required. We then had to table the APP in March. Chairperson, Government always uh, coordinates uh, our programs uh, through what we regard as apex priorities, um, which um, then emanate from what would have been the manifesto of a party uh, that must guide us then in terms of the Lekutlas up to the cabinet Lekutla and inform then what the state of the nation addressed by the president say. These are priorities then are that consequence and department is to select those that are relevant to its mandate. So these are the seven priorities, just to recap, building a capable ethical and developmental state, economic transformation and job creation, education skills and health, 
consolidating the social wage through reliable and quality basic services, the issue of spatial integration, human settlement, as well as local government, social cohesion and safe communities, a better Africa and a better world. The main um, cross-cutting focal area for all of them relates to matters of women, youth, and uh, people with disabilities. In updating the medium term strategic framework 2019-2024, we then looked at the following informing guidelines and strategic documents. The National Development Plan, review report, head to assist us. You look at then the issue of the impact implementation plan for the fourth industrial revolution, the skills priority master plan of the country, the district development plan model, uh, that uh, government has used as a model for service delivery to improve and change livelihoods at local level. Then the national COVID-19 response plan, the economic recovery plan, as well as the revised fiscal framework uh, that relates to the budgetary implications for the government. So the intention is to integrate all our key plans uh, so that they are results-based and they, that they uh, respond to the MTSF priorities. MTSF chairperson uh, is critical because it informs the partnership and the agreement between the minister and the president, and it must find expression in the work of, cover of the department uh, so that we are able then to account and the minister is able to honor his obligations uh, to the president in terms of that agreement. Chairperson, the roadmap and milestones that we followed were then, as I have outlined earlier, between the month of July and the August 2020, it was a preparatory phase uh, where we were looking at the roadmap, consultative uh, processes that we had to do in terms of the also literature review um, in NDP, Fourth Industrial um, um, in Re Revolution Report, uh, Priority Skills, as I've mentioned. We then looked at the issue of updating and our APP and our strategy and that is through also consultative processes with clusters and other departments on recovery plans. Working sessions then we had to conduct with the cluster and joint cluster subcommittees. And then we looked at the engagement with the MTEC on the plans that we have. Finally, to then concretize our plans uh, that is now between December 2020 and January 2021, where we consolidate and finalize MTSF update, and then the circular issued for the departments for updating the APPs was complied with, as well as the preparing of the MTSF for January Criminal Recruiter, uh, where we to make inputs and the publication of the updated MTSF. In all of these, Chairperson, we were looking at the uh, biannual reporting that we need to make. Um, on the MTSF, as well as the updated roadmap. But also during this process was confirmation of all the intergovernmental alignment uh, via the PCC, as well as approval through cabinet. And finally, uh, during these processes, it was then the final updated MTSF that then concretized all our interventions as a department in setting our targets as informed by the state of the nation address by the president. So if we look now at the strategic plan um, itself, Jefferson, we just indicating our mandate and that uh, our mandate emanates from uh, our own constitution in the Republic of uh, South Africa. And uh, it talks to sections uh, 16.1, which talks to the freedom of expression, it talks to the issue of section 30, on the, which re, re, really directly directs our mandate on the issue of language and culture, um, where it states clearly that everyone has a right to use the language as well as to participate in the cultural life of their choice, but no one exercising these rights may do so in a manner that is in contrast with any provision of the Bill of Rights. In other words, we are entangled by the Bill of Rights in whatever we do as a, the master director of all our values and our freedoms and rights that we must adhere to. 
Then the next one is the access to information and um, that we also have to, we are informed with in terms of section 32. So further then the constitution affirms that democratic values of our human dignity and equality uh, must always um, uh, be the foundations of the constitutional imperatives and that the department must ensure that its powers that it is given are aligned to and are executed in line with these foundational imperatives of the constitution of the republic. In that then our policies, we develop our policies, we implement the national policy, we implement these policies and we drive the programs with regards to our sport, arts, culture and heritage as well as recreation in the country based on these foundational values. Chairperson, what is the vision of this new department? The vision of this new department as was refined, as we developed, uh, it is that we would like to have an active, creative and winning socially cohesive nation. And, and this we will find in the expressions of our, of our programs also in terms of the branches that we have. How do we plan to achieve this in terms of our mission? Is that we'll provide an enabling environment for the sport, arts and culture sector, as well as to foster an active, creative nation and a socially cohesive nation that we would like to have as envisaged in our constitution. So in achieving this then, we will contribute towards the development, transformation, as well as preservation and protection and promotion of sport, arts and culture. So all our programs must respond in terms of these areas of development, as we have said. Now, what are the values that must drive our performance and our conduct as officials of the department? We are saying Batupili, um, which is a non-negotiable and not a slogan, has to be implemented to the fullest. And then we're saying equality, everyone should be treated equally and have equal access to and opportunity and also participate in opportunities that are provided through our services. We will be an innovative nation. That is one of our critical um, value uh, that is finding creative solutions to any challenges that we might be having as imposed, for example, now by COVID-19. We commit to be responsive to all our uh, clients and citizens that we serve, particularly the members of the sector in the sport as well as a creative fraternity. So a department should be quick to react to requests from and provide feedback to the public and other stakeholders. Integrity, that we do our work with a high level of integrity as well as professionalism, and that we are committing to be accountable as expected uh, of us. So we are accountable then to the people of South Africa in our quest to provide them with high quality services. These are the values of the new department. How then did we uh, go about what is our storyline? When we look at the, we are saying that uh, we have overarching government priorities we look then at um, which ones do we respond to. And these priorities are the building a capable ethical and developmental state, as we have mentioned. Then we said, okay, out of these seven, what impact do we want to make as a department? Is that we want to have what we call, what we regard as a transformed, active, creative, and winning nation. Which priority outcomes do we respond to and how? These are the outcomes we believe we should make, is that increased market uh, um, share, as well as create opportunities in the sport that are bigger and better for our people to be indeed active and winning nation, as well as opportunities in terms of culture, as well as creative industries. But also that a diverse, a socially cohesive society with a common national identity will be the outcomes of our interventions. What will be the enablers or enabling outcomes? These will be transformed, capable, and professional sport, arts, and culture sector. 
but also that the sector will be integrated and accessible, will have that accessible infrastructure as well as information. These are crucial because without a proper infrastructure and without proper access to information, you cannot then develop and grow this sector nor the citizens. Of course, then the issues of compliance and being able to be responsive to everything that we do. So these outcomes or chairperson, we believe uh, should be able to drive our work. Now, how do we measure our performance? In looking at how do we measure our performance chair in developing this, we looked at uh, all the possible uh, research available and what does it say we are in terms of our core indicators or core outputs that we want. So as I go through them, it's just to indicate that when we looked at the index of the cultural and creative industries growth index, the, the issue was that uh, to grow this sector, we looked at the baseline, which said we are at about 4.9%. And we commit that uh, within this five-year period under these diverse conditions, we should be able to be at 5%. But also this then, we indicate to you the source of information so that uh, these are not um, sucked, um, targets in terms of the five-year horizon. Exports of cultural goods and services as a percentage of all exports. We believe this must be increased. A baseline says we are at 0.45, and, and yet we would like to be at least at about 0.6%. This chairperson is to deal with the issue of import-export deficit, that currently the country imports more of foreign cultural goods uh, than and exporting it. We need to reverse that trajectory. Percentage of gross domestic product attributable to private and formal cultural production. Baseline that we're at 1.7%, would like to be at 2%, at least in this particular indicator. Number of people employed in the cultural and creative sector. And this number is at 2.5% of total employment but we're saying that this must be increased to 4%. And then when you look at the broad-based economic empowerment procurement spending, um, we are at 78%, uh, which is indicating that 70% uh, is, is what is expected, but currently we're performing beyond that at 78%, uh, but we do not want to change uh, what has been set as a target. If we outset, outperform the target, it's fine like we're currently doing. And then the percentage employment equity, and this is about 45% um, women at senior management level, as well as 2.1% of people with disabilities. And we are saying that um, as government has uh, clearly indicated and instructed that at least 50% or more of women should be at SMS level. And that is what we're working at and to make sure that we always are at 50% or more. And then 2% with people uh, people with disability, not to reverse, but just to, this is what is said um, in accordance with DPSA, but that will always try and perform better than that. Chairperson, um, when we talk about a, a diverse, socially cohesive society with a common identity, we also looked at some research uh, at our disposal that is available to tell us where we are. And then we set the target. So there is research that is done about being proud uh, of being a South African, which says um, at 83%, but we would like to say uh, in five years time, at least 90% of all South Africans, when they are asked, they must all say you they are proudly South African. Public opinion on race relations, this area needs to improve. In 2018-19, it was saying that uh, the race relations issue is at, uh, it's low at 42%. We would like to increase this to about 60% uh, through our programs. Socially co social cohesion index, 
was saying that uh, we had 61.4% and we're looking at increasing this at, to be at least at 70%. Percentage of citizens who show a strong devotion to their country, patriotism at its best. We're talking here that at 82%, and you can see the alignment with it, they're being proud <laughs> of South African country. And that will be 95% in there by, by the end of the MTSA. What will be the enablers for us to do that? We then said uh, Jefferson under the outcome transformed capable and professional uh, sport arts culture sector. Is that uh, the outcome indicator will be the arts and culture sector organized into councils affiliated under the CIFSA and that uh, there will also <coughs> be improvement in Olympic and Paralympic medal status. And then on the base, what is our baseline currently? We don't have an overarching umbrella uh, body that uh, have all kinds of uh, affiliate to CIFSA. So we are looking at uh, uh, the baseline that says that's why we must make CIFSA work to make sure that we have this overarching umbrella uh, where like SASCOG, we have to talk to one federation, it's able to then talk on one voice for the sector. Five year target councils, uh, for the sector genres, different from different genres, they established. Under Olympics, uh, 2020 Olympic and Paralympic uh, will become the baseline on how we perform. We know this is gonna happen in July, and then at least increase of 10 medals in this regard. <laughs> Integrated and accessible um, infrastructure and information here we're looking at the number of sport and recreation facilities compliant with the norms and standards. Currently we have 137. We are hoping that by year by 50, I will be at 175. And then on the compliance responsive governance is that our audit outcome should be clean. The strategic focus chairperson <coughs> So if we look at then uh, what are the government priorities now and we do the linkages between the outcome and the output, you will see Chairperson under economic transformation and job creation, which is an outcome that we respond to directly, is that we are saying uh, for the department now is that we will have increased market share of and job opportunities in sport, culture, and creative industries. Now, what interventions then we'll be making? So under enabling framework, well-researched, regulated and funded sport arts culture sector, we will then have the intervention also in relating to providing support for a range of cultural and creative sector initiatives, which will also be promoting the diverse creative cultural industries. <clears throat> we will also have expansion in the new and traditional creative industry markets, as well as have increased their participation by those who are historically disadvantaged. What, how will you know this is achieved? The outputs will be cultural industry policies be in place, the research conducted, as well as intellectual property development and integrated funding for the sector under the support of range of cultural and creative in initiatives. And here, we have film, documentaries, and books, e-publications that uh, will be telling the South African storyline, flagship and cultural and sport events that will be, take place, imaging creative program, as well as the issue of visual arts. Under this, we have art bank acquisitions that we do, as well as the national orchestra that the country will be having to be proud of. So under the expansion of the creative economy industry markets, we will have more market access programs, touring ventures will be undertaken. We'll have also then the exchange programs through what we call cultural seasons. We'll have sport and heritage tourism, and we'll also have marketing and promotion of all the sites of for and the events for sport, arts and culture. Then in terms of procurement, 
and, uh, and increasing participation of historical disadvantaged. We're looking at the increase uh, spending for the, on the SMMEs, cooperatives, as well as the black industrialists. Under the target is under the priority of social cohesion and safe communities. Uh, the outcome for the department is a diverse, socially cohesive society with a common identity. Interventions that we'll make will be increased awareness of charter of positive values and national symbols. But also another which under this initiative or intervention, we'll be having campaigns on the charter of positive values led by the moral regeneration movement, including the issue of then the national symbols and, and the, the I am the flag campaign. Workshops uh, to advance knowledge on national symbols, South African flags installed in schools, monumental South African flag installed. And the equalizing opportunities, inclusion and redress, the outputs will be the transformation social compact, standardization of geographical names, documentaries, uh, profiling living human treasures. Chairperson, and then under the increase in the action across space, race, and class, uh, we will create here, we're using interventions such as national days, community and, and, and art centers, as well as the schools hubs, as well as the issues of uh, Africa Month, uh, that we have just passed. We will also have a uh, social cohesion advocacy programs, community dialogues and conversations, as well as national uh, convention on social cohesion. Then under the priority dealing with education, skills and health, we are saying that uh, our outcome is transformed, capable and professional sport, arts and culture sector. Interventions here, Chairperson, will include the increased awareness of the sport, arts, culture offerings and opportunities. Here, we will have promotional campaigns. And then under the intervention capacity building in the sector, we have what we call competence audits that will conduct Artists will be placed in schools, including athletes uh, that can do coaching and training wherever we can, and then be able to have practitioners who are supported through academies. We will also have bursaries offered in the areas of language, as well as uh, sports uh, bursaries. This will include also then the issue of uh, the life skill support to the practitioners. Under the Sport as culture practitioners are achieving success at international events. You will remember, Chair, we spoke about a winning nation. Here we're talking about support of the high performance artists and athletes. Also, the issue of the national school sport championships, the support in terms of scientific support services, government support to anti doping agencies as well as achievements uh, in the sport, arts, and culture. These should be the indicators of our success of our inputs. And a capaci to capacitate, organize, and professionalize the sector, as we indicated earlier, to have at least an umbrella body, a sector organized into councils affiliated under CIFSA, as well as accreditation of sport, arts, culture sector practitioners as well as a course material thereof. Then the last one is about spatial integration, human settlements, as well as a local government um, that we are looking at. You will remember Chairperson, we spoke about the intervention of government to organize a one district, one plan. And so one of the key issues on local government is to make sure that there is visibility of government services. So we are saying that we will have, a, as a department, our outcome is an integrated and accessible um, sport, arts, culture infrastructure uh, that will assist us to make sure that we are visible in these areas. Chairperson, when we look at the 
interventions, we are saying that uh, there will then be uh, access uh, to information. This will create through the libraries that we built, which are either built and newly built or the, the, or the libraries that uh, are already, we call them uh, modular libraries. We will then have also national archives upgraded. We will also work on publishing house to make sure that particularly the imaging um, uh, authors or writers who are also using particularly the African languages have an opportunity to get their works uh, published. Documents translated and edited uh, in various uh, languages as well as the multi uh, human language technologies. This is where we develop various technologies in line with our indigenous um, uh, knowledge uh, systems that we're trying to make sure that there is scientific terminologies in our African languages. Then we've got uh, infrastructure programs. This really talks to what the chair had raised about the legacy projects to transform the national language heritage landscape. We will also implement a number of uh, provincial resistance and liberation heritage route sites, resistance and liberation movements museum, Chairperson, which you had raised as one of the critical areas. And then of course, the issue of the National State Theater, uh, we committed to have a state of the art with the cutting edge technologies uh, theater in the country. Then community art centers refurbished as well as sports infrastructure projects. Finally, Chairperson, we're talking about multi-purpose sport, arts and culture hubs and or precincts. Here we're talking about the establishment or development of multi-purpose centers, which we regard as hubs or precincts at both national, <laughs> regional and local level. Chairperson, what are the outcomes, uh, the linkages that we're talking about? Uh, we continue then to say, um, the one that talks to administration is compliant and responsive governance as a department. Interventions, performance and financial oversight. And this would include in making sure that we've got proper strategic plans as well as annual performance plans as well as uh, the issue of the MTF, as well as the ENE that we would have submitted, but also ensuring reporting as well as audit outcome that uh, is, as I indicated, moving from the what we regard as unqualified uh, to make sure that we have clean audits. Irregular, unauthorized and fruitless and wasteful expenditure eliminated. Then we have capacitated human resources. Uh, we can't work without people, but these must be people with the right skills placed at the right um, areas of performance and also doing with the right attitude. So here we'll have work skills plans, internships, vacancy rates that are below 10% as per the prescription by um, DPSA, but also that there is a clear employment equity as well as consequence management affected, as well as then ensuring that there is diversity and transformation strategy. Under integrated stakeholder management, we're saying that we participate in the various cluster coordination, intergovernmental forums, enter into MOUs between the three levels of government, as well as ensuring that we comply with integrated policy framework in execution of our plans. Strengthen public entity oversight mechanisms, this relates to the declaration of the PA Opera House and uh, to be a one of our key key areas or sites of operation by our creatives, uh, so that uh, we in each and every province, at least we've got what we call a uh, theater is that where people will be able that where the creatives will be able to go and participate and perform or do training <coughs> or any problems that they can have. So this has happened uh, we are happy. The minister just did this PE Opera House one uh, this week. And then shareholder complex, 
whereas fully constituted and functional councils, as well as oversight visits to public entities uh, to do monitoring, but also as per the call by the white paper, revised white paper, uh, that uh, some of the entities be amalgamated uh, to ensure that there is greater efficiency and effectiveness. And this might mean also integration of the boards or councils so that we reduce the cost incurred just on having too many councils. But also then uh, service delivery, we hope that this will be measured by improved turnaround times for payment of invoices, continue to be 30 days or below, and then service delivery improvement plan that will be in place to target various services that we render and what should be the improvement targets there, as well as then the citizens being happy of the services they receive from us, particularly when we talk about the sector direct beneficiaries uh, from the department services. And then Chairperson, key factors that inform the development of our plan. These are the factors, adaptation to the COVID risks, uh, um, COVID-19 risks accelerated um, need uh, in terms of economic recovery, transforming society and uniting the country, response to gender-based violence and femicide, cross-cutting focus areas that uh, we had mentioned, the issue of women, youth, as well as people with disabilities, fighting corruption and strengthening the state, capacity of the state. So our performance here, we're just giving you our targets, uh, honorable chairperson and honorable members. Uh, under program one, which is administration, we are saying that the purpose is to provide strategic leadership, management and support services to the department. This program has got the following sub-programs, ministry management, strategic management and planning, corporate services, office of the chief financial officer, as well as the office accommodation, stroke auxiliary services. What are the outputs for this uh, program? Program one, which is led by DTG Chikotamba, is that percentage of intents enrolled against funded posts should be at 5%. Number of services modernized, there will be two, and then we outline them later. Then the number of awareness campaigns activated, seven, and we are hoping that uh, for this year it will then be nine. And then we are looking at one uh, at a uh, percentage of invoices paid within 30 days, uh, that um, uh, we should do that 100%. And then percentage of councils or boards that are fully functional, all of them must be fully functional, 100% target. When we go to program two, Chairperson, uh, program two is recreation, development, and sport promotion. And the DDG is DDG, uh, Deputy Director uh, Ms. Khan. The purpose of this is to support the provision of mass participation opportunities, the development of elite athletes, as well as the regulation and maintenance of facilities. It has got four sub-programs, a winning nation, which supports the development of elite athletes, active nation, which supports the provision of mass participation opportunities in sport and recreation, and then sport support. This refers to the issue of integrated support system to enhance the delivery of sport and recreation. Then the infrastructure support, this regulates and manages provision of sport and recreation arts and culture facilities. This sub-program also then helps with technical support that is provided when construction is being undertaken. If we go to the next slide, Jefferson, what are the targets then for this particular program in this financial year? One is that the number of athletes supported in the scientific program will be 80. And then number of athletes uh, through, supported through academy is 3,700. And then we look at the number of, of the sport and recreation promotion campaigns, eight. Number of school hubs provided with equipment, 2,500. Number of learners in the national school sport championship per year, 5,000. Then number of learners participating at the district school sport tournaments, 75,000. 
then percentage of national federation meeting the 50% or more of all prescribed charter transformation targets, that that should be at 78.9%. We have 15 out of 19 there, Chair, because currently the focus is on the 19 sporting codes that we are at measuring in terms of their progress towards a transformation. The number of municipalities provided with technical and or management support during construction, 50. Number of community outdoor gyms and children play parks constructed, 10. The number of heritage legacy facilities um, that will be maintained to transform the national hand heritage hand landscape, three. The next program is program three, which is arts and culture promotion and development, which is led by Deputy Director General, uh, Dr. Kumalo. The purpose of this particular branch is to promote and develop arts, culture and languages, as well as implement the national social cohesion strategy. These are the key areas of focus, national language services, this promotes the use of and the equal status of all the official languages. It entails then the issues of language terminologies as well as human language technology, translation and editing services, as well as the awarding of bursaries. Cultural and creative industries development, the focal area here is to support cultural and creative industries by developing strategies, implementing sector development programs supporting sector organizations programs and providing training support to arts and culture practitioners. Also falling under this branch is the international cooperation. This assists in building continental and international relations for the promotion and development of South African sports, arts, culture, and heritage by participating and influencing decision-making in identified multilateral as well as bilateral, bilateral forests. Social cohesion and nation building. This is to implement national social cohesion strategy and bring together the targeted groups in arts, culture, and heritage. But also this includes issues of arts and culture in schools, as well as into the mainstream. This program is also responsible for the coordination of priority six, which is social cohesion and, so, and the safer communities. Then we have, uh, lastly, uh, sorry, then Mzanzi called an economy. This seeks to create economic and job opportunities at Jefferson, but also the issue of development and training in this area, as well as market access, all fall under Mzanzi called an economy. And then we've got the department then responsible for transfer of funds falling under this uh, branch and that is National Film and Video Foundation to support the development of skills and local content and marketing of South Africa's film, audiovisual and digital media industry. Their targets, Chair, are as follows. Uh, we were saying here, we will have multi-year human technology projects supported for, we are saying there will be percentage of official uh, receive documents that are translated and edited, 100%, bursaries awarded, 250, and that is in terms of the language and uh, bursaries that we gave. And then of course, international market access platforms supported financially at 12, and then of course, the capacity building a project supported 20, and then the number of provincial community arts development programs implemented, nine. Number of international engagements coordinated, 20. And number of moral regeneration projects supported, five. The number of community conversations, 20. A number of youth forecast arts development programs, four. A number of advocacy platforms on social cohesion uh, implemented by advocates. These are the distinguished eminent persons in South Africa with high levels of integrity appointed by minister as social cohesion advocates, 20. We continue a social compact for social cohesion and nation building, one, and the number of monitoring reports uh, 
for on the implementation of the compact too, as well as the number of gender-based violence and femicide programs and that fight against this, which would be financially supported, one. And then we've got number of projects in the creative industry supported, 67. And then we've got number of artists placed in schools, 300. Number of reports produced by SACO in terms of their research, 21. And the number of films and documentaries supported in telling South African stories, particularly about the history of liberation, culture, and heritage importance that we are saying that would be 10. The next program, uh, which is the last program, is program for heritage promotion and preservation. This branch is led by DDG, Deputy Director and uh, Vusita Mandema, and is responsible and its in main purpose is to preserve and promote South African heritage, including archival, as well as heraldic, which refers mainly to our national symbol, as well as oversee and transfer funds to libraries. Under heritage promotion, we support a range of heritage initiatives and projects. These will include um, the issue of support at, at a level of conceptualization, equipping and operationalization of legacy projects, but also we're dealing with the issue of the resistance and liberation heritage route, as well as the relocation of statues, the issue of Peru of heraldry, the registers of symbols, popularizing the national symbols themselves, the issue of the flag, national flag, the monumental flag that they will be working on, but also flags and schools, and the conservation and management of the South African heritage, as well as development of policies and legislation for the preservation. Then we've got a subgroup that is with National Archives, which is a memory of the nation. And this means we acquire, preserve, manage, and make accessible records with enduring value to the country. The public library services, as indicated, we transfer funds, uh, the breakdown will be provided uh, in terms of to provincial departments for conditional location to community library services for constructing and upgrading libraries, hiring personnel and purchasing library materials, materials so that there is no white elephant libraries that are built and then they are left there. We make sure that they are resourced. The department transfers funds then to the South African Geographical Names Council, which is an advisory body that facilitates name changes and consulting with communities to advise Minister of Sport, Arts and Culture on proposed names. DG, you are left with five minutes for your... No, oh, Chairperson, yes, then yes, you the, conclude. the targets, uh, <laughs> Chairperson, will uh, then be that number of students awarded with bursaries and um, the target, uh, Chair, can someone just, uh, there is something blocking here, the target of 2021. There is a block there, Chairperson, that I'm not able to see now my, the targets. Um, can that be removed? It's blocking the view completely. Okay, uh, no, can the technical DG. team remove that block? The target is 65 mm -hmm. TG. Um, thanks, uh, but can someone remove that block? Okay, thanks. And the number of books documenting living human treasures too. And then we're saying that the number of public awareness activations of hashtag I'm the flag. Um, that will be uh, then uh, uh, depending, uh, I just want, Please, Chip. Someone is really blocking the the real targets there. But uh, let me just uh, uh, read here. That would be twenty, and then the number of flags provided to schools hundred, and then the number of heritage policies developed two, the number of workshops hosted um, on the to advance knowledge on national symbols ten, and the number of heritage legacy. Uh, projects where exhibition content is, is developed three, and then the number of progress reports on resistance and liberation heritage route sites, one. Uh, Chairperson, 
Can I then ask that in my three minutes, just a high level summary of the budget by the acting CEO, CFO? Yes, go ahead, CFO. Good morning, Chairperson. Good morning, members. Good morning, Minister, the DG, DDG's colleagues. Um, I hope you can see my face. Oh, let um, my name is Bong Lemondila. I'm the acting CFO. The budget that will be supporting this um, strategic plan and APP for the year 2021 to year 2023-24. Uh, we've got four programs, as DG has already said, in the department. Uh, for the year one, 2021-22, the budget is at 5 million. 693 million 941,000, and it's broken down into the different uh, four programs. And for the next year, year 2023, the budget will increase to 5 billion 828 million 283,000. The last year, it's 5 billion 886 million 466. Next slide. The Slides before us is showing the budget per economic classification, Chairperson. We've got current payments where we've got a compensation of employees and goods and services. In, and then we've got transfers and subsidies, mainly under uh, current payments. Our budget for the year 2021 22 is 965,991,000. The following year, 2022 23. It's uh, 979,271,000 and the outer year 983,8. For the transfers and subsidies, Chairperson, I will not go on line by line because the department has different transfers that we transferring to the different departmental agencies. And we've got transfers that we also transferring to our provinces and for the libraries, the mass participation. But and I'm getting a, an echo, sorry to person, but I hope I'm clear. We've got different uh, transfers, as I'm saying, for the year 2021-22, the total budget for the transfers is 4.5 billion. For the year 2022-23, it's 4.6 billion. For the outer year 23-24, it's 4.6 billion. Next slide, please. Next slide. For the payment of capital assets, we've got a budget of 210 million for the year 2021-22. For the year 22-23, we've got 197 million, comma one, and the 23-24 year we'll be having 204. Next slide. Mainly the budget that we are presenting, it's a as we said, we've got most of our budget transferred to the different entities and um, <clears throat> departmental agencies and the municipal and the provinces, which is about 79% of our budget for the year 2021-22, which totals 4.5 billion. And budget that will be used within the department is about 1 billion, 176, which is about 21% which is mainly our COE and our goods and services. This a pie chart, it shows the different um, sectors that we're transferring to that we're saying, uh, this is the budget that we will be spending to our provinces, departmental agencies, higher education, hey. foreign government, public corporations and the NPIs. Next slide, please. This is, uh, as I already said, that about 21% will be spending within the department. Next slide. And these are earmarked uh, funds, uh, chairperson and members, where money will be going out for the year 22-23 for the cap work, capital works for public entities. We've got about 203.3 million. For the year 23-24, we've got 205.4. And it goes down to the different, uh, we've got capital works for le legal projects, 
for heritage assets, upgrading of spaces, library, uh, community libraries, MGE, that is on Zanti Golden, NVF, and the other entities as it's shown on the slide, which totals to the total budget of 1.2 billion for the year 22-23, 1.3 billion for the year 23-24. Next slide. These are specifically and exclusively appropriated funds uh, for community library grant. We've got about 310,6 for the year 2022-23. 324.3 million for the year 23-24, and that is for the CAPEX and for the current thereof for community libraries. We've got for the year 21-22, which is um, 1.1 billion, and the following year 1.2 billion, and the last year 1.2 billion. For COE compensation of employees for the year 21-22, we've got 372 million, comma four, the year 23. 22-23, we've got 368.6 billion, sorry, million. Uh, for the year 23-24, we've got 376.4 million for the compensation of employees. For the grant uh, MPP or Mass Participation and Sport Development Grant, these are the allocations, which is 591 for the first year 21-22, 591 million. The year 22-23 is 601.9 million. And the outer year 23, 24, it's 603.9 million, which totals to the total budget of our specially and exclusively appropriated is 2,4 for the year 21, 22 billion, and 2,5 billion for the year 22, 23, and the outer year 2,5. Next slide, please. I think that's the end of our presentation. Thank you, Chairperson and committee members. I'm speaking with uh, with my mic off. Thanks, thanks, thanks a lot uh, for the presentations, uh, uh, Minister and DG. Uh, Honourable members, here is the input, the presentation from the Department of uh, Sports, Arts and Culture. This is their, I think it's our second budget uh, this year. Um, uh, Honourable Minister, in your absence, uh, I, I, I raised certain issues in my opening remarks. Amongst them were issues related to uh, the policy on policy project on repatriation and restitution of human remains. Uh, we celebrated when the remains of uh, Sergi Bartman was brought to the country. Um, and we're still waiting other human remains. Our process, our oppressors were the worst criminals. They were not only killing people. They were mutilating and taking their mutilating them and taking their bodies, uh, you know, shipping them home to whoever. Uh, we're still looking for the head of uh, Hoshi Bambata. We're looking for the head of Hoshi Mahoba. Um, I've never heard of people who were so cruel like this in the world, where you not only kill people but mutilate and take their bodies and use them as trophies. Uh, and many other warrior kings who and people whose bodies were mutilated and their parts were taken were shipped to uh, to the white man's land. The uh, issues of transformation that I raised, uh, uh, Honorable Minister, it's, mm, your what is your uh, transformation agenda? Um, what is what is informing the transformation that the department is talking about? Because amongst others, you are charged with ensuring that uh, the Department of Sports, uh, Arts and Culture, and the industry itself gets uh, transformed. Honorable members, uh, it's, let us engage with the inputs by asking questions and comments. Uh, I will look at the, just monitor this from the, and see which hands are up. I can see the hand of uh, Honorable uh, uh, Gillian, followed by Dalmain Christians, and followed by Nogut Zol and Dongeni, in that order. Thank you, 
Thank you, Chair. Sure. Just waiting for this. Chairperson, thank you. I okay, there you go. In program one, Chairperson. <coughs> sorry. Ensuring good governance among public entities is one of the objectives of program one during oversight visits to the Free State and Gauteng, there were complaints among staff, labor unions, and artists on the recycling of board or council members who have a record of poor performance, as well as council members serving in multiple entities within the same sector. What does the department have to say about these allegations? And how will the department ensure good governance in the wake of such allegations, especially given the crisis of the presidential in employment stimulus program distribution? What steps will be taken to ensure proper screening of councils appointed in the entities going forward? And then also in this program, have all the critical vacant positions be filled by the department? And if not, why is the process delayed? I thank you, Chairperson. Um, thanks, Honorable Gillian. Honorable uh, Christians. Thank you very much, Chairperson. I'm going to leave my um, video off, Chairperson, because of um, signal in the Northern Cape. Um, Chairperson, my first question <clears throat> to the department is about the um the money that has been redirected the 20 million or um, not redirected but the amount of money that has been set aside by the department of 20 million uh for the 2021 22 budget for the national monumental project now uh chairperson in light of the fact that um artists have been facing such a huge loss of income and job opportunities. And there's really been an outcry in the media with regard to the amount of um, unemployed artists at the moment, the number of artists that have lost their livelihoods. It's really been a battle. Um, so this 20 million that has been set aside for the national monumental flag, could the department not rather have direct, redirected that money? so that they could have assisted, um, you know, these people in the um, department, in the department, in the sector, the artist sector. Um, you know, especially in light of the fact that we are possibly facing um, a COVID-19 third wave, which um, could be potentially worse and could potentially mean more loss of income for these people. Um, the second question, um, I'm going to ask is um, the gender-based violence programs for 2021-2022, um, where will the emphasis be directed um, and how will these programs be rolled out? Because in spite of the money, the amount of money that government has been spending on gender-based violence, we simply have not seen a reduction in gender-based violence. And I'm really concerned that different departments are rolling out programs but we never really get to know what these programs are and where they aim at and to who they aim at, which communities, um, et cetera. So I'd like to know a little bit more about how those programs will be rolled out within uh, this department. My next question is about the 300 artists that will be placed in schools. Um, again, um, <clears throat> how, what will these uh, artists be paid to be placed in schools and which communities will, will be um, will be catered for? Uh, where, where will it be rolled out, in other words? And also, what is the aim of this project eventually? And then lastly, something that is really, um, you know, uh, the, the, the speaker, and I'm not sure who it was, said that race relations is really problematic in the country and so on, and that there should be a, a focus on race relations. And my question is, where and how will these programs be run? Um, I think it is absolutely fantastic that the department is running a program to focus on race relations, because I think it is a time where the country needs it more than ever before. Um, if they could just explain to us a little bit more in detail um, where these programs will be run and what the ultimate aim 
of the department is in the rollout of this program. Um, thank you very much, Chairperson. Thanks, uh, Honorable uh, Christians. Um, Honorable Ndongeni. Thank you, Chair. Thanks about the presentation. I just have just a few questions. Does the department have any plan for the third wave? If they have, if they have the plan for the third wave, can they please explain us, explain to us? And then the other one, they have a plan for GPV, and it is and it how going to spread the awareness of the GPV. The third one, the last one, chair. The last one, the last one. Under the under the following KPI 2.9 number of municipality provided with the technical and management support during construction, how many municipality have been used? Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Honorable Ndongeni. Um, are there further hands members who like to, whose hands cannot show on the system? Um, in the absence of, of any, um, can we get the answers to some of the questions and clarities that was asked by members? Thank, thank you, Honorable Chairperson and Honorable Including members. if we'll, uh, get, uh, we'll ever get that, uh, the Kalinan diamond from the Queen's uh, <laughs> crown. Yes. No, I'm we'll, told we'll, it comes we'll from, from so It comes from Tuani. It must come back to Tuani. <laughs> it must come back home. Now, Honorable Chair, uh, I will ask Ms. Ndima to talk to that policy and um, the program uh, he is here. Um, because I think uh, we'll allay, we will assure uh, the chairperson of what is being done concretely in this regard. So I will ask that uh, maybe first my colleagues, um, I give them opportunity to, to respond. I will then chairperson just uh, summarize where I have to, uh, if there are gaps. But uh, can I start with the uh, DTG Kumalo? Um, I think she can be able to talk uh, to a number of questions relating to, to GBV artists in schools. Um, and then Mr. Ndima on the issues of the flag, um, particularly the, the monumental flag and the issue of the budget there. But can I ask a uh, chairperson without wasting time, uh, did it Kumal? Um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, DG, and um, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson and members, uh, for the questions. Let, let me start uh, with the questions around the GPV um, awareness uh, programs um, that we are doing as a department. Um, specifically, as I indicate, um, these are the programs that are aimed towards uh, campaigning against the sketch uh, of GBVF. And um, it's, it's a number of programs that have been integrated um, so that they have got impact um, in, in as far as um, this campaign is concerned. I will just then briefly outline uh, what those particular programs uh, interventions are, and also just mention uh, the, the specific areas that they are targeting, which are obviously not exclusive, uh, Honorable Chair, uh, but they've been structured in such a way that they orientated towards um, specific um, uh, target groups within uh, our society. Um, we have got a program that has been running since last year, which we call Bakawa Fazi. Um, it is uh, loosely translated um, 
uh, Women Heroes. This particular program is aimed at um, raising awareness, particularly targeting women and youth, um, girls uh, in other words, in a sense of um, warning uh, them against um, um, what has actually been pertaining in as far as this particular sketch is concerned, but also telling the stories, um, the actual stories uh, of the experiences uh, of uh, those women that have been victims. So the basis is, is basically um, the testimonials that are telling the untold stories of the gender-based uh, violence and femicide. And this is done through uh, raw footage, uh, Honorable Chair, from the survivors of the gender-based violence, particularly focusing on the 30 hotspots uh, throughout the country. Hotspots as defined uh, by the South African Police Services. So that's the first program that forms part of this integrated uh, uh, campaign that, that uh, the department has embarked on. Uh, I said it started last year, last financial year, and it is continuing into uh, this year. Uh, obviously escalating and spreading even wider. The second program is was launched by the minister um, in September last year. Uh, it is referred to as the Hulukane, uh, translated um, uh, as um, uh, it's enough, uh, Seguanele. Uh, this is a campaign, um, again, a 365 days campaign which um, endorses a call to action by men, uh, and it is driven by men to end the gender-based violence and femicide through behavioral dialogues, uh, panel discussions, grassroots uh, anti-gender-based violence activations that are specifically focusing on the father and the son. Um, through camps and, and other such uh, interventions. Um, this is the Hulikan uh, program and um, it, it is uh, also going on and is part of this integrated with the orientation towards men. As, as I said, the first one orientation uh, towards women. Uh, the third one uh, is the Silapa Wellness Program uh, which can be interpreted as saying, uh, we are here for you, uh, artists and sports practitioners, but also can be interpreted as uh, we are healing you, Silapa. Uh, I'm an artist and I'm a sport practitioners. Um, this one is an open engagement, uh, honorable chair and members uh, that addresses the wellness challenges um, in both the arts and culture and the sport industries which is inclusive of addressing issues of depression, legal, financial management, but also the issues of abuse, where uh, these uh, creatives and the sports practitioners that are experiencing, be it in the form of being victims or the attributors of this particular um, sketch. They can then be able to get access uh, to counseling in other forms of services that are provided through this SILAPA. So this is the integrated program uh, that we are talking about. There's a program, uh, an action plan that has been drawn up without taking too much time. Uh, che, um, I'm, I'm trying to summarize, pardon me. Um, the program has started um, already, but for the next six months, um, starting for the, for, for the month of June, uh, it's going to KZN and July going to Northern Cape. Uh, we are finalizing the provinces that we are going to be going to in August, September, October, and November. Um, on the issue of the uh, number of artists, uh, Honorable Chair and, and members and minister, um, indeed, as our program says, uh, that has been presented by the, uh, the DG, we are looking at placing 300 artists uh, in schools. Um, the objective of this particular um, uh, program is two-pronged, uh, Honorable Chair. 
The one target is uh, obviously creating jobs, but the second uh, targeted objective is around um, ensuring that we influence um, the, the focus on the creative industry as a career um, from the grass, grassroots level by working together with the Department of Basic Education, working together with the schools, and we've brought on board the Honorable Chair, the community art centers uh, that are also, that are the ones that are tasked with the responsibility of implementing this program at grassroots level. And as I said, uh, the objective is, is two-pronged, creating job for the artist, but over and above that, it is also looking at ensuring that uh, the young people that um, perhaps based on the talent they have within the area of, of the creatives are actually getting the practical information and exposure to what the creative industry is, an, is about and what it entails. Uh, the, the honorable member asked a question around whether or not these artists are, are, are paid. Yes, indeed, uh, they are paid. The, the total budget that the department has set aside for this financial year is 18.9 million, uh, honorable mm -hmm. chair, with 2.1 million uh, go, going towards each of the provinces. Um, there is information in terms of for instance, uh, if we talk about Northern Cape, uh, which are the areas uh, Francis Bart, uh, uh, John uh, Taule, Pixley Kaseme, uh, ZF Mkawe, for instance, in the area of the Northern Cape and others, uh, in terms of the specific targeted area uh, where these uh, schools have been identified uh, with a total budget of 2.1 million per province, uh, Honorable Chair. Um, thank you. Um, I think you, you asked me to address those issues, uh, DG. I hope I have covered the areas that you wanted me to cover. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair and members. Oh, indeed, the DDG, uh, Mr. Ndema. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, DG. Uh, thank you, Chairperson, and uh, thank you, Minister, and honorable members. Uh, maybe let me start by uh, talking to the issue of policy uh, on uh, <clears throat> repatriation and restitution of human remains. Uh, also, to confirm what the Chairperson has said, uh, that um, <clears throat> in 2002, we had to repatriate the remains of uh, Sarah Bartman, who had been uh, parodied as fake show attraction in 19th century Europe, where to repatriate those uh, human remains as part of uh, bringing back dignity to Sarah Bartman. And it was without policy. Similarly, in 2012, we had to uh, repatriate the, 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 the remains of a couple, Glass and Dory PNR, uh, that was in 2012. These were, this is the couple that was dug out of their graves by an Austrian anthropologist, Rudolf Pech, in 1909. And this was done in the name of science. In fact, he was working under the uh, auspices of the Austrian Imperial Academy of Science, uh, which had actually said you must obtain skeletal, linguistic, and casual material of indigenous people of South Africa for scientific analysis. So they were actually being dehumanized when they were dug out of their graves and they were taken to the Austrian museums. And hence, uh, former President Mutlante was very pivotal in saying these remains had to be returned to South Africa and be given a dignified burial. Similarly, our stalwarts who left the shores of this country uh, to fight for our freedom, uh, Uncle Moses Fortale and J.P. Marx remains were returned in 2015. And uh, these happened without any policy. So we had to work very hard uh, 
chairperson to, to ensure that uh, there is this policy so that whatever we do and whenever we do it, it's being done within the parameters of the policy. And I'm glad, uh, chairperson, to report that this policy was approved by cabinet on the 24th of March, 2021. So we have the policy. What we are working on now is to see how we will be implementing this policy by consolidating the development of clear criteria and uh, also clarifying how requests for repatriation and restitution will be dealt with. Uh, also looking at the resources, working with our uh, institution, the South African Heritage Resources Agency. So that work has been done uh, at Jefferson. Of course, uh, in, as part of the transformation of the heritage landscape, uh, we have already done the uh, audit of uh, uh, cultural resources, statues, and monuments. Uh, they, they, those that have been audited amount to 1,789. The idea here is to also look at those statues that are not in line with the values of our constitution so that uh, they can be relocated to regional cultural nation building parks. So that's part of the transformation of heritage landscape, which also is trying to say, we cannot continue to glorify atrocities. Now, coming to the question that was asked by another member with regards to the national flag, I think it's very important that as we look at this, at the entire spectrum of work that is being done by the department. We adopt a holistic approach. Yes, it is indeed important to say our artists, our creatives, our athletes are very much important, but the work of the Department of Sport, Arts and Culture transcend artists and creatives. It begins to look at very important symbols in our society. For instance, if you look at the uh, the national flag, it is the primary national symbol uh, enshrined in our constitution. And its significance is that it ushered in a post-colonial and post-apartheid democratic political dispensation. It is the monument to non-racism, non-sexism, non-tribalism, and non-credalism. So it is a very important uh, subject matter in the department. And I think it's a subject matter for uh, all South Africans. And that's why we envisage this to be an iconic monument that should occupy the pride of place in the imagination and memories of South Africans in perpetuity. So yes, if there is a need at any point in time that we, we begin to look at resources and we see maybe the need to cut wherever we can, but I just want to make it a point that we all understand how significant this particular uh, uh, monumental flag is. Thank you, thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, did you come? Municipality infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. thank you very much, uh, Chair, uh, DG, Chairperson. With regard to the infrastructure and the um, indicator of how many municipalities have been uh, uh, where they've been given support. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Ma um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairperson and colleague who, uh, and the member who's asked the question. If we look at the support, I'm talking about from 2017 when, the, when, the, when we put in the indicator, we have given support to 165 municipalities. Now, if we're looking at support, it may be that one municipality may get more support, may get support more than once because the projects are multi-year projects. So from 2017, there have been 165 uh, municipalities who've been given support. Included in the 165 uh, chairperson is 29 new projects that are starting now at the, from the 1st of July in the new financial year of the local government. And these are brand new projects that will start on the 1st of July. So that, there's 29 new ones that will start now. Uh, Chairperson, I'm not sure, uh, and with DG's permission, if, can I talk about the transformation as well within the sporting sector? Yes, please. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chipperson. Chipperson, if we talk about sport and the transformation in sport, uh, we have a very structured way of responding to the changing environment in sport. And within the uh, and within sport, we have a transformation charter that was adopted at the National Sport and Recreation in Daba in 2011. And the transformation charter guides the change in our sports federation in very strategic areas, both on and off the field. And this includes demographic representation in key areas, access to participation, uh, capacity development, governance, and economic empowerment. So we look also at the federation's uh, uh, procurement spend and who is benefiting from their procurement. And the status is determined and it's monitored and it's monitored by measuring the actual performance annually in the areas against these targets of the charter. Um, and Mr. Chairperson, we also have, we have used this charter over the years, but we realized that the charter is a one size fits all. And hence then we've adopted in 2016 a barometer a barometer where the sports federations actually set their own targets. And then we actually assess those federations against their self-set uh, uh, targets. And where they do not achieve 50% or more of the targets, then there are penalties that are imposed on the, uh, on the federations. And in terms of the penalty, the minister has uh, the power then to suspend or withdraw any funding from the, from the federations that the government provides. We also can revoke the authority for them to bid for international tournaments and also withdrawal of the opportunity to award any colors or others. Uh, and in, for them to agree, uh, Mr. Chairperson, we sign a, an MOU between the federations and SASCOC. So, so there is an MOU in place. So the federations are very aware that they would be um, subject to penalties if they do not meet the target. Um, over the years, uh, Mr. Chairperson, the transformation charter is overseen by an eminent persons group, which is the EPG, who report directly to the minister. So they oversee this. And each year they prepare a report, which is called the EPG report. So the report does not only give us, uh, Mr. Chairperson, an indication of the performance of the federations, but also guides us as a department into key areas where we need to actually strength, strengthen our own delivery. And if we look at over the years, Mr. Chairperson, the various areas that have come out, I think there are many things that come out of uh, uh, um, the report. One issue is around the governments in the federations, but an important issue is also the population dynamics in the, pro in the country, where we find that over the years, there's a growing population amongst our younger people, the people 18, under 18 years old. And there is a diminishing population group of the white population, where the greatest number of our sports federations administration lies. So there is a risk, Mr. Chairperson, of us losing a lot of the institutional knowledge in terms of the administration of sport. And hence that then indicates to us, we need to now start building the capacity of the greater number of people who are under 18 or 18 and between 18 and 35, the youth, and also to start capacitating in the other race groups especially the greater, the, where the dem demographics show that the greater numbers of our population need to be skilled to take on administrative roles in the federations. The other area, Mr. Chairperson, is the area of school sport. And we see that school sport being our bedrock for development and our nursery, that we need to ensure that the school sports programs are developed and there's a strong school sport program in the country to ensure that the nursery and the talent and the skills development within the schools helps us in the greater uh, sports development continuum to take our young people from development to high performance. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairperson. Um, are there other additions from the... Yeah. Yes, uh, there was a question, Chairperson, on the 
oversight of entities, uh, Sakio. And then uh, without waste time, there was an issue of the post uh, that uh, DDG Chikwatamba would talk to. Uh, Sakio. Uh, thank you, DJ. Can you hear me? Yes. I think the question was um, around how do we ensure um, good governance in our institution? And I think the the other leg of the question was around ensuring that we do not recycle um, our council members and they, that they do not serve in multi councils. We have a number of interventions to improve governance in, in our institutions. Um, we have established a number of forums to ensure that there's constant engagement between the department and its entities. Number two, we also have to ensure that whoever is appointed um, as a council member undergoes an induction within the department so that they get a sense of how the sector works and how it's structured. Number three, also we have partnered with IODSA, which is the Institute of Directors of South Africa, which is one institution in, in, in South Africa that oversees governance and is also custodian of the, of the King's report. We also ensure that our council members or whoever is appointed to serve in our council is registered with this institution and they benefit from a number of interventions including training um, that is offered by this institution and we pay for the registration and um, of these council members to be part of that body and of course yes we do have a, a challenge of recycling and and some of the council members serving in in number of councils and it's something that we, we have, we, we're working on as a department. Uh, normally when we appoint councils, we appoint them when they're about to lapse. So there is an open process that we follow and it's stipulated in the, in the legislation or the acts of which are um, of the respective institutions. But what we are intending to do as a department now is to actually do an open process where we call for applications from all over South Africa and we develop what we call a board bank. Uh, basically our open uh, call for people to apply to serve in our council will not be as a result of a vacancy that is open in the councils. We're just gonna do an open call now so that we develop that comprehensive uh, uh, board base or database for for lack of a better word, in which we then make sure that we have a, a diverse pool of resources and expertise in our, in our, in our data pool. And that will allow us, uh, because now we, if we do it as an open call process, that means now we have subscribed to the law which, which regulates those entities, which requires that we open the process to the public. And therefore we also then make sure that we maintain a, a, a board base and whenever we need a resource, we then go back to our, 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 board, ba our, our board base. So that is one of the areas that we're gonna have to look into, to make sure that we don't recycle these council members um, in the different councils and they don't serve in a number of councils. And of course, uh, through our instant, constant, um, constant and um, engagement with our, with our entities and our boards, will be able to guide them in terms of the legislation and the regulations that they need to adhere to. So we do those side visits and one of the interventions that we are looking also at as a department to avoid these situations that we have witnessed in some of our entities is to look at whether the feasibility of having a representative of the department serving in these councils not as a member of council, but in an advisory capacity so that they alert them to some of the legislations that they need to subscribe to. Uh, because some of these council members are from private sector and as such, some of the, the, they might not be aware of all the legislation they need to subscribe to. So these are some of the interventions to ensure that we avoid some of the negativity that is um, uh, playing in the space now uh, around our councils and we try and improve governance. Thank you, DG. Uh, DG Chikotamba. Uh, th thank you, DG. Thank you very much. Good morning to the members once again. I, on the vacancies, I can report that uh, though we have a high number of vacancies, 
there is a plan in place to fill these vacancies. If I can speak to that, uh, that plan, it started to be uh, put in motion um, around about August, September last year, when we had a batch of uh, 25 positions that were uh, advertised. And uh, follow up to that uh, this year, around about March, we had another batch of 32 positions that were filled. And I must uh, contextualize why we are doing this batching. Um, we, I think, uh, are experiencing the response uh, based on the high level of unemployment. We get very high numbers of applicants. So the process, uh, the process of uh, uh, capturing these and um, doing the verifications uh, where we need to communicate with applicants, sometimes it takes a little bit longer. But of the positions uh, that were of the first batch, much has been done. Um, I'm equally also a product of that, uh, my arrival in the department. And of course, uh, the last batch, uh, we closed the applications late in March and the response handling is underway. And of course, we've already also started with uh, setting up interviews. Um, I must also indicate that, uh, yes, we started a little late last year because of the impact of COVID and uh, uh, making it uh, not practical for some applicants to travel around, and therefore we had to uh, delay uh, setting up appointments until as well we were also internally organized uh, in terms of how we're doing business electronically where we could uh, do such. Um, but I must uh, uh, say I, I, as head of corporate services uh, led by the DG, uh, committed, we are committed to filling these vacancies. However, I must also mention that uh, we are also doing that with care, given that uh, we are also rationalizing our staff complement after we have uh, combined two departments that are giving us now one department. So we are also managing where there are staff overlaps in terms of the functions of staff members from one department to another is now we're, we've come together into one department and we are working towards our, our final start structure uh, ramping up uh, beyond our startup structure. Thank you very much, DG. No, thanks very much uh, for, the, <coughs> for that, uh, DG. I think um, uh, most of the questions have been answered. Uh, just to emphasize the issue around the budget prioritization vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, relief, uh, that uh, honorable members are reminded that yes, where we can, we do reprioritize the relief measures uh, are put then in place as we reprioritize the budgets. And then um, we do that without undermining the fact that this APP we're presenting to Honorable members today must still be implemented. And therefore, the name work, as Mr. Ndima had said, needs to still continue. And, and that is why then we need to see where do we prioritize what and, and how much towards the issues of relief and the fight against COVID. But also that, um, as we know, government has a, the, that is program of economic recovery of the sectors and uh, that um, also to deal with the employment issues. And that's why the PSP uh, was established and is in place. Now, working on uh, possibilities of the third wave, uh, we just want to indicate that yes, Chair, um, in terms of what government guide us on what to do to deal with the issues of COVID-19, um, a third wave it would be treated in just the same manner uh, where there are challenges around the issues of a high um, spread of this issue. We do this, uh, of course, through the, the, the directions that uh, are provided as we engage with the various sectors, uh, whether it's in sport or is it in uh, culture or creatives uh, that we have to engage with, then the plans are drawn. But in relation to relief, we always look at what it is, uh, what is the implication at that time, 
and be able to say, do we then reprioritize what budget? Because there was no budget that is called a, a budget for COVID-19 per se, but it's about being nimble-footed and respond to that as we anticipate the impact and we know what has happened in the past and currently is happening on the plight of the creatives and the athletes. And therefore then and there is currently a relief that is uh, running uh, to support the creatives, while at the same time, even these programs we have uh, are geared towards uh, ensuring that uh, the creatives and the sport people are the most beneficiaries uh, to do the work they want to do, uh, giving them then what we call sustainable livelihoods uh, through these programs. So Jefferson, uh, then when it is coming to the third wave, should it happen? and uh, the status of a lockdown because we don't remove our response in to be outside of the government's way of dealing with the levels on what to do. Then depending on those levels, whether it's a lockdown or it is a, a partial uh, restrictions uh, that do not uh, ground their activities to a halt, we then have to respond according to that. But Chair, we must emphasize that unfortunately we don't have um, adequate resources to be able to say we will make the relief available to everybody because the demand outstrips the supply. So it, it is just unfortunate uh, that the uh, unfortunate uh, country's economy, we're not able to really make good to every individual who claims or who says I'm an artist. Hence, then we use the processes of selection uh, that we ask people to come forward. Because one of the challenges we have, Chair, is, is the lack of a real database with registered all creatives so that when you're dealing with these issues, you have a clear understanding of who is a creative, who is an athlete. And that is why with the legacy of COVID-19, one of the things we have started doing now is to create a national database um, of our creatives. And the same would be happening with the provinces. So that at the end of the day, not anyone claims I'm earning a living through this, when in fact, this is my, I'm a choir master, I'm a teacher, and therefore then I earn a salary somewhere. And it's not my livelihood that I earn. So those were the difficulties we were facing, Chairperson, at the beginning of this process. Hence, we have also started with the creation of the database, of course, assisted by the sector organizations who submitted their own databases. And we're hoping that that will assist us also to have a very targeted response uh, in the face of the COVID-19 uh, challenges faced by the sector, which is a very long haul. Then I think Chairperson, uh, the issue of then uh, the the GPV, uh, I think that has been uh, exhaustively covered by TDG Kumalo, and I hope that honourable members uh, have a sense of that, uh, what we are doing in these programs. Uh, the race relations programs uh, are the same under the social cohesion. We do have programs and dialogues, and uh, normally at the attempt to make sure that we spread the rent. This works together with our national base, but we believe more is still to be done, but also through the MRM uh, programs uh, that they have. But I think Chairperson here, we, we still need more because the issue of the racist ideology uh, that is extremely pernicious continues to raise its ugly head uh, from different parts of our country. But we also utilizing our social cohesion advocates, as I indicated, who develop programs, they target areas that are, they believe are in need, then the department provides uh, that, and these are appointed throughout the country. And it's them who help us more in trying to address these challenges that we have on issues of social cohesion and nation building. Among them, the issue of race relations, um, as you will see, when farm workers are complaining, farmers are also complaining. And all these things are about social cohesion and nation building 
bringing our people together to understand that we are united in diversity. And that's what we must achieve. So social cohesion advocates are the ones who have quite broad uh, programs that assist us in addressing this issue. I think those are the main things I, that uh, maybe I needed to just emphasize, Chairperson. On council members, I can just add two things. That uh, also the minister signs what we call a shareholder compact with the councils to make sure that they have to understand in terms of their fiduciary duties and clean governance, they are key responsibilities and accountability also to the shareholder. But over and above that, where there are challenges reported of any allegations of mismanagement or corruption, uh, we either directly get involved if there is an impl implication that the board is involved, then forensic investigations will be conducted uh, to determine the nature of such uh, allegations, whether they are true or not. And when they, where they are true, then the consequences are affected. So those are some of the measures, Chairperson, that are put in place to encourage good governance. So that even where there is whistleblowing, we leave no stone unturned and investigate such matters. Either minister will instruct the board to do so, or if the board is dysfunctional, then minister or is implicated in the allegation, then minister will have to institute an independent investigation outside of the board. Those are the areas. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Um, thanks, DG. Uh, <clears throat> the, if two members still want to make other follow-up questions, or uh, Noltan, how are we doing with time? Um, We have three other reports to, we have reports to adopt after this and minutes. Um, Noltando? We're still doing fine, Chair. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, DG, we, we just some um, little touch up questions here and there. Um, there were issues related to the revised uh, indicators that were changed to two of them, and a new indicator was uh, added. Uh, that is, uh, that one is the indicator 4.6, APP 4.6, uh, on page 5157. And uh, the revised indicator 4.7, that talks to number of heritage uh, legacy projects and, you know, uh, I just want to check why were these indicators changed and why did we have a new one that wasn't there before? And um, the other worrying issues is uh, we have been receiving calls from families, particularly one family, uh, because I'm in their area in Skukuninen, who have lost a um, a volunteer who joined Dum Konto Esizo in the 60s and fought in Zimbabwe together with other volunteers from Dum Konto Esizo in the Zimbabwean Chimurenga. Uh, most of those fighters, some of them fell in the war in Zim and they are buried in unmarked graves. So to give peace and rest to these families, we need to do something about uh, bringing back the remains of these uh, gallant volunteers who fought in the liberation of Zimbabwe on their way to come and fight at home. Um, the one from my village that, I, you know, the daughter talked to me about two months ago, uh, saying that she had a dream about her father, but she has never seen her because she was born when the father was in exile. But, you know, uh, was also known as Pogo. Please, please, please let work this this policy, speed up this policy so that we can give this family a rest. Uh, the living will never rest if we don't solve the problems of those who are living ourselves. The dead will never rest until we solve our problems. 
um, some of the questions that are not answered, if we feel that we did not get the adequate answers, we'll make follow-ups in writing uh, to, the, to the department. Um, yeah. Uh, over to you. Uh, Maybe, Chair, before you, you proceed, Chair. Yes, uh, Honorable Minister. Well, Chair, thanks, man. Uh, I think uh, the the department, the, the DG and, and uh, uh, DDGs have uh, been able to uh, to respond to the question. But I want to go back to the question by Honorable Killion. <clears throat> Having noted all what, what has been said uh, as a response uh, on the recycling of, of members and few members uh, in many council. One aspect uh, the DG and the team did not touch on is that first and foremost, people apply. That's where it all starts. Uh, and, and I've heard these uh, complaints, people who have not applied. And even when they have applied, they go through a, a rigorous process because they are supposed to be in those councils to transform them and transform society. And you'll be surprised, Chair, that there are people who, to this day, uh, are anti-transformation. Definitely those people won't be appointed. I'm just making that as an example. So it starts with people applying. Uh, and uh, if one and the same people are applying, when the department advertises out there in the media and everywhere, uh, it's the onus is upon those people uh, in the final analysis. On your issue, Chair, <clears throat> look, an example which we have made about Zimbabwe, for instance, of the fallen uh, cadres of uh, Umkondo Wesizu. Uh, you can uh, think of others as well from other liberation movements and so on. Um, <laughs> right now, we are dealing with one aspect of the Vienna camp in Angola. You have in one camp 300 fallen cadres. Um, so it's not possible to repatriate all of those people. I'm talking about just one camp. You have many camps. You have many uh, liberation armies and so on and so forth. So if and, and, and they were talking about this liberation period between the, the banning of the liberation movements. But you can go back to the First World War. You can go back to the Second World War, people all over the world. Uh, we, we don't see the possibility of repatriating everybody back to South Africa because it will take more than the budget of the state as a whole to do that. There are, um, as uh, Didi Chindima was, was raising the point, there are other aspects of uh, respecting the people through uh, certain monuments which should be in those particular areas and so on and so forth. So right now where we are, we are at a point where we are engaging with the, uh, the public, including yourselves, to see that the uh, uh, just repatriating one person. We have repatriated some of them, uh, as uh, the DTG was saying uh, before the, uh, the the policy itself. We we have committed as cabinet to honor those who fell outside of our borders, but we are not guaranteeing to repatriate simply because of the finite uh, budgetary resources uh, to repatriate everybody back home. Now, uh, it's those finer details which uh, we are finalizing. Uh, the, 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 the government is very much uh, uh, on board in terms of uh, this matter. Uh, in fact, you, we've been approached by people uh, whose grandfathers and great-grandfathers uh, fell elsewhere on the continent and uh, in other continents in the First World War, for instance, uh, and so on. So, the process is there, uh, the political will is there, as much as possible uh, we'll do 
what will be within uh, the, the, the resources, as it were. But thank you very much uh, for, for that uh, intervention. No, no thanks uh, very much, uh, Minister. Um, I, I think the, the follow-up has been covered, except on the issue of the revised uh, indicator and that the chairperson has referred to. I'm trying to find it here, but I I, I can't uh, see it on my uh, 4.6. It's still talking to something different, chairperson. If I can just be uh, assisted, because if I look at the targets under 4.6, uh, it's not uh, making reference to a revised down target. Um, on the item the Honorable Chair is raising. Maybe you can assist me. Honorable Chair. Are you asking me a question? Yes, I was saying that uh, in um, when I look at um, the target 4.6 itself, it does not reflect a revised down uh, target. Uh, as I'm saying it's a, I said it's a new indicator. It was oh, not in your indicators before. There are revised indicators, two of them, that is 4.2 and 4.7. 4.2 talks to the number of books documenting living human treasures. Yes. And then the other revised one is the one that talks to a number of heritage legacy projects. You know, and then the, the one that I'm saying it's new, it talks about workshops hosted to develop to develop knowledge on of national symbols. But I'm yes, saying sir. that why were those ones changed? And why was this one added? Yeah. Chaperson, the the one of the I am the uh, under human treasures. We just thought that it's important to increase the numbers because the people there, uh, if you look at them, are aging people that we target, so that we download their knowledge. And the more the more of them passes then the less fortunate we will be to gain that information and be able to document it. So what we do then, we look at increasing the number so that we can do more in a year. Okay. Mm. Now, I'm, 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 I guess I'm clarified, yes. And then the, the issue of the number of uh, uh, progress reports on the the number of LECA heritage legacy projects where the exhibition content uh, is, uh, is developed, where they we are dealing here, Chairperson, with the, the legacy projects that are completed uh, now and envisaged to complete and be finished, also one of them in this financial year. That now, we, from the construction phase, we now have exhibitions. And that is what now we need to put inside those structures so that they then become a meaningful museums. And that is what we're doing, like the one in Brantford is done now. Now we're dealing with the issues of exhibition and the interpretive centers. And I think Chairperson, those are the areas that um, I think we needed to add clarity on. All right, uh, thank you. Um, we move into, what's our time, uh, Honorable um, Noel Tando for oh, this 18 minutes past 12. Um, do, we, do we release the members of the, uh, the minister and the team so that we deal with the reports? and the minutes of the meeting, or can we deal with those when they are here? I'm awaiting direction from the members. We must release them, Chair. 
All right, thanks. Um, Honorable Minister, the DG and the team, uh, thank you for availing yourself and engaging with us and clarifying us on some of the issues that needed clarity. And uh, yeah, and thank you very much. Uh, Minister, do you want to say some few words of, uh, before we release your team? No, uh, just to thank you uh, and the honorable members and uh, uh, with the engagement and very important points and questions which have been asked. Some of them would still need us to go back and, and do more work uh, on that, but thank you very much. That's a vote of confidence from the community that we, we hope that you will be able to to do some of those things that needs to be done quickly and uh, ensure that the artists during this um, third wave do not go hungry. And yeah, thank you very much. You, you uh, must you vote are, for more money for us, Chair. <laughs> you, are, you are released. <laughs> No, thank you very much. Thank, thank, thank you thank very much. much. Um, Honorable members, thank you, colleagues. Have a good day. Bye, thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Good day. Honorable members, let's... Um... Bye. If you can all... Also, we deal with internal uh, issues, matters. Um, honorable members, let's say um, we are, we have two. Yeah, I can. Wait, wait, in front of Let me see. I'll see where it is sort of a Um We have reports that need to be adopted. The, the, committee, sec the committee secretary sent these reports to us uh, to, make, um, to make inputs. And yeah, let's fly the first report, um, Noltando. Uh, it's the minutes of the 19th of May, Chair. The minutes of the 19th of May. These minutes were distributed to the, to the members uh, quite some time ago. Is there any uh, comment on the minutes? Any any mover for adoption? Dongeni moves for adoption. Honorable Dongeni moves for adoption of the minutes. Um, any second? I second. Chair. Second. The next one. Um, Minutes of uh, what date again? It's the 26th of May, Chair. Joint the 26th of May. Portfolio Committee on Higher Education. It was a joint meeting. Yes, Chair. Yeah. Was not there. Look at the report. I wasn't in that meeting. I don't think so. Um, can anyone, any comments from this minute? Any comments, correction? Nothing. Um, any mover for adoption? I'm 
راه نما لندی کنانه نیهی شه هرم ما نیهی لیهی یس او یه اونرال بیهی موسو ادابشن اینی سیکنده I second chair if I was there. <laughs> Honorable Bacha seconds. Um, so therefore, the minutes are adopted. Is there any other met on the agenda? Um, uh, is the report, Chair? Yes, the first reports, we're dealing with which one? It's basic education, budget vote 16, Chair. Yeah, these reports were distributed to members quite some time ago. Uh, we're starting with vote 16. This was a joint meeting. Huh? Any mover for adoption of this? I move to. I second to. Okay, so therefore the report is uh, is uh, it's it's welcomed by the committee. It's adopted. The next one. Higher education and training vote 17. We've had these reports for quite some time. Honorable members, uh, any mover for adoption or any objection? None. Any mover for adoption of this report? Don't get any moves any second. Any second. I come to Nangoku for a high Any second, I end on getting moving for the adoption. Is there any second? That's the question. Who is seconding? Mm -hmm. Honorable Lihihi, thank you very much. Next. Report of the Select Committee on Education, Tungunur Sports, Arts and Culture on Budget Vote 36, Science and Innovation. Um, we've had this report for quite some days. Any mover for adoption of this report? Don't get any chair, move the report Don't to be adopted. Any moves? Is there any, any second? Any second? I second, sir. Second that uh, 
any other um well, this was the last one sir this was the last item um so for so we are at the end of our meeting um let me take this opportunity to thank the members for uh, putting their weight behind the wheel and ensuring that um, the committees, the department that reports to us, uh, we play an oversight or role on them and ensure that they do the right things and do them the right way. Thank you very much. And this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Well, thank you.